Today we have the rare opportunity to visit with Mark Anthony, a true psychic explorer. Welcome to the Afterlife Files, where we investigate near-death experiences, shared death experiences, and how they affect you. Unlike podcasts that are just stories, we will give you a heads up on what to look for in our conversation, and then after the interview, stick around we will help you make sense of those accounts so that you can incorporate the insights into your life. I think you'll find that once having your most profound questions answered, living life in the physical is filled with more peace and joy. Mark Anthony is a near-death experiencer and fourth-generation psychic medium who communicates with spirits. He's an Oxford-educated attorney licensed to practice law in Florida, Washington, D.C., and before the United States Supreme Court. Mark travels to mystical locations in the remote corners of the world to examine ancient mysteries and supernatural phenomena. We caught up with him on a break from his book tour where he's getting out the word on this latest book, The Afterlife Frequency. Here's my heads up on what to look for in our interview. Pay attention to how he does not differentiate between the different forms of contact with the afterlife. Next, there are several sections on how we adjust our frequency to the afterlife frequency. This topic is near and dear to my heart because that's what we do. That's what we teach people to do at the Expanded Awareness Institute. I also like his metaphor of the proximity of a radio station and its interference with the reception of normal communication. It's quite clever and very clear. The interview ends with his departed mother's moving explanation of Mark's mission on Earth. Here's our interview with Mark Anthony. Hey, Mark, really glad to have you here on the Afterlife Files. Thanks, Scott. It's great being here. I've been looking forward to this. I have too. And this is just great because your latest book, The Afterlife Frequency, and this podcast, The Afterlife Files, would seem to be talking about the same subjects, wouldn't you think? Seems rather synchronistic, and and absolutely, because the reason I wrote my book, The Afterlife Frequency, and the subtitle is The Scientific Proof of Spiritual Contact and How That Awareness Will Change Your Life, is to explain the various forms of contact with the afterlife. And what I found is that when people are studying near-death experiences, shared death experiences, deathbed visions, out-of-body experiences, mediumship, they tend to put them in separate categories. Mm -hmm. And what I found through my research is that there is a commonality between all of them And that's why I wanted to write the afterlife frequency to explain how those of us who are in the material world are able to touch, to in other words, to adjust our frequency to touch with the afterlife frequency. And so I'm a firm believer, Scott, that there is an explanation for everything. And ultimately, it will be based on science. And so that's why... I take a scientific approach to spiritual phenomena. You are a medium, a lawyer, a, a obviously now an author. So you are kind of approaching this from lots of different directions. How did this all get started? Uh, it's funny the way you say that because when people say you're a lawyer and a, and a medium and <laughs> Well, what it is, my, my both my parents were mediums. This is a genetic trait that runs in my family for for generations, and we could do a whole show um, just on on the the psychic uh, people in my family. But my dad was a U.S. Navy SEAL and an aerospace engineer, and my mother was a commercial illustrator and an artist. So 
they were from very different backgrounds. And when I say that my parents were mediums, they were not running around wearing turbans and waving Ouija boards and, and flinging tarot cards at people. We were the all-American family next door. And, and and I remember joking with my mom and dad saying, well, we were kind of more Adam's family than Brady Bunch, though. <laughs> but but uh, because, I love it. well, yeah, it's like I remember when I was going, starting school, I started first grade when I was five. And dad said, don't talk to anyone about your ability to see spirits. Only talk to your mom and I because people won't understand. And I saw pretty quickly that other families were were not quite like mine. And then as I got older, um, I was raised in the Catholic faith, and I thought that I wanted to go into the clergy, but I felt that that was too restrictive. Also, you know, when I was a teenager and, you know, the whole being a teenage boy thing, it's like uh, clergy, priest, celibacy, not for me. Um, and also, uh, from a spiritual standpoint, uh, leaving all joking aside, I felt that it was too restrictive, too many rules and regulations. So, Scott, I ended up in the legal profession. <laughs> so, <laughs> Rules and restrictions. I, I, yeah, it's kind of like I jumped out of the regulatory uh, frying pan right into the rule-laden fire, if you will. But um, I, I was drawn to, to the legal system. And it, what I liked about the practice of law, I've been interested in so many different things throughout my life. Um, biology, history, theology, philosophy, quantum physics, um, I, I, and, and I love traveling to mystical uh, hot spots around the world, studying ancient mysteries, uh, exploring ruins and spiritual phenomenon. I just love doing that. And one of the things that I enjoyed about the practice of law, it reminds me of, uh, do you remember that movie called The Devil's Advocate, where Al Pacino yeah, plays the yeah. head of this law firm, and he hires a young associate who's Canal Reeves? And then it turns out that Al Pacino is the devil, all right, um, which, you know, doesn't do a whole lot for the legal profession. <laughs> but uh, but Canal Reeves says, why? Why law? And Al Pacino goes, because it puts us in everything. And and that was such a great line. Uh, and leaving the, the negative tones of the movie aside, think of one aspect of, of anyone's life. And I'm saying this to the to the listeners that doesn't have some form of legal regulation. The law literally is in everything. And so when I was practicing law, I started off as a prosecutor and I was handling all types of criminal cases. Then I, I was hired by a criminal defense law firm. And then eventually I was working in both criminal defense and personal injury. And throughout the course of my career, I had to work with chemists, forensics, Physicists, accident reconstructions, neuroscientists, biologists, doctors, and I ended up specializing in head injury litigation and studying the human brain. So then when I shifted out of the practice of law full-time into mediumship, and I started studying the science behind spirit communication, my backgrounds in all of those things all tied together. So that in a nutshell is how I got where, where and where I am now and what I'm doing now. So what's the status from your perspective on science and the study of psychic phenomena, near-death experiences, et cetera, et cetera? In, in my book, The Afterlife Frequency, I introduced the term the electromagnetic soul, the EMS. And I'm very honored, very humbled that a number of uh, scientists have been uh, using that term now, the, the EMS. And what I found in my research uh, throughout my life, every great spiritual teacher, going back 5,000 years to the sages of, of uh, ancient India, through Zoroaster, Buddha, Moses, Jesus, Lao Tzu, Confucius, Muhammad, through Native American spirituality, the spirituality of the Pacific Rim. What I found is that the major belief systems all hold that the soul or the spirit, whichever one you want to call it, is who and what we are. And that energy, that soul, 
pre-exists the body, comes into the body, and moves on after the body dies. Mm -hmm. Then through my study of science, the laws of physics teach us that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. We know from the field of neuroscience, which is the study of the human brain, that the brain may be 3% of the body's weight, but it is the most complex electromagnetic field in the body, and it uses up 20% of the body's energy. And so that when we physically die, that energy doesn't disintegrate, it is transferred from one form to another. So that's how I developed the term, the electromagnetic soul, which defines what we really are, which is a consciousness, a soul, which is eternal electromagnetic energy. Now, how does that tie into spirituality? Think of the EMS, the electromagnetic soul, in terms of a drop of water. And it did, in the brain did not create the EMS. It's like a computer hard drive, it merely hosts it. You know, because your computer hard drive didn't create Windows or whatever Apple programs you use. But, but the data on there is stored. So when the brain slash hard drive crashes, that energy um, plunges into this eternal sea of souls, the collective consciousness, just like, you know, the information on your hard drive gets uplifted to, you know, the cloud, uh, Dropbox, uh, whatever, whatever storage system, you know, offsite that you use. And so the EMS explains a lot of things. It explains spirit communication because it all has to do with frequency. And I get into this in great detail in the afterlife frequency about yep. how you know we're able to shift our brainwave frequency and a spirit is able to, a spirit, an electromagnetic soul or group of them align theirs. Think of it this way. We as humans live in AM radio. Okay. The other side spirits, they're FM radio. And so what happens is we are able to increase our vibrational frequency. Spirits are able to adjust theirs, and we get a frequency match in the zone between the afterlife frequency and the material world frequency. So does medical science actually talk about the creation of this EMS, the creation of consciousness, or... You're saying that it exists before and forever. The fascinating thing, and I've, I've discussed this with Dr. Gary Schwartz, with Dr. Eben Alexander, with Dr. Jeffrey Long. You get a book on neuroscience, a book about the human brain from medical school. And let's say it's 900 pages long. Well, guess what? There's going to be two, maybe three paragraphs about consciousness, but not how it's created. Neuroscience is completely at a loss to explain how consciousness is created. And that's why getting back to the EMS theory, um, that the soul, the EMS, pre-exists the body, comes in and moves on after the body dies. And so uh, that's the origin of near-death experiences when the body, when the EMS leaves the physical body, has an adventure, and then comes back to a reanimated physical body. Exactly. Uh, think of uh, a near-death experience. Here's your electro. Here, here's your brain. Here's your electromagnetic soul, and it leaves the body. Okay, so you die, or you know, uh, you, maybe you're drowning, or it could be on a. Uh, operating table. It could be through many ways. And I think of it kind of like a rubber band. Okay. Your EMS is, is attached to it. goes, Reem. okay. And you touch that afterlife frequency. That's why you go through the tunnel. You get the feelings of uh, floating. You'll encounter people uh, who have passed that are connected to you. And in some stages, you'll get to a point where you encounter this infinite energy filled with love, the sense of interconnectedness that, dare I say, I call it the divine power that we call God. And with a um, uh, near-death experience, you're, you know, you're stretching that uh, rubber band and then it pulls you back. Whereas mm -hmm. with a death experience, there is no rubber band. You continue on. And I remember that's what uh, Dr. Kenneth Ring said about 
um, my last book, uh, Evidence of Eternity, he said that um, we only deal with touching the other side, but Mark's work as a medium takes up where where that leaves off. And and I in in and that's the way that that a near death experience works is because your electromagnetic soul is still energetically tethered to your body, and yet you're in a shift between two different dimensions. Um, I did a, a talk on this for IANS, uh, I believe it was in 2022, which I referred to as the NDE zone, which is the zone between this world and the other side. I know that um, PMH Atwater and Nancy Evans Bush and Jim Bruton have also talked about this zone in between. Yep. So have you had a near-death experience? I did. I did when, when I was four years old. And um, normally I don't tell stories from the book, but since since it's you, Scott, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Well, um. About six months before that, that's when I started seeing spirits. I was three and a half years old, and I was interacting with my invisible friends, which mommy and daddy could see, too. All right, because it's not unusual for toddlers to, to have invisible friends, but when mom and dad can see them, and I remember mom was like, oh, he's got it. And dad was like, oh, geez, he's got it. You know, because <laughs> dad, dad was concerned it would it make my life difficult. Well, Dad, we we moved to, um, we were living in New Jersey, and my dad got a job in aerospace at Martin Marietta, which is now Lockheed Martin, and he was away on a business trip, and it was in the summer, and we were living in Orlando, and this this epidemic of impetigo swept through our community. Oh, and I got it really bad. And the doctor told my mom, oh, just put him in a bath with some um, bleach in it for, you know, for the sores on him. What he didn't realize is that I had it so bad, I developed septicemia, which is a blood infection. And I started going into um, pulmonary failure. And I remember I could smell the bleach and I'm in the bathtub and I, I stopped breathing and my mother was horrified and she, she, she picked me up and, and she, she told my sister, um, who's about 14, she said, call, call an ambulance. And, and my brother, meanwhile, uh, he was about nine years old. He ran across the street because a fireman lived across the street from us and he saw his car there. Um, and he knew that he was off work, and we called him Fireman Rory. I remember Fireman, that was his first name, Rory. And he came out, and, and, and Mom was standing in the front yard. She goes, help me, Mark's dying. I mean, and, and so he started doing CPR on me, and then he said, um, we got it. We got to get him to, to the hospital. And so when the ambulance arrived, they got me in on a gurney and in the ambulance, and when they slammed the door, the respirator was on me, but the hose got caught in the door. Oh, dear. And so, yeah, so so the ambulance is, is hauling butt to, to Orange Memorial Hospital. And the the paramedic said, oh, my God, we, he's, he's, he's going into respiratory failure. And the next thing I knew, Scott, I, I, I flew right through the ceiling uh, of, of this ambulance and I remember being, you know, looking at it going, why are there numbers on the top of the ambulance? You know, I never saw a top. It was four. I never saw the top of me. And now I know so helicopters can spot and, you know, it's like they can track like what, you know, police cars and ambulances have numbers on the top. of. I didn't know that. So in the next thing I knew, I was in this flash of, of, of it was like a flash. And it's always hard for me to talk about this. And there was these beautiful beings they they look like human human shapes but they were clear and translucent mm -hmm. and they glowed from the inside out there was a lot of them and they're really nice they were very nice to me and they were telling me not to worry well meanwhile back in the ambulance the ambulance driver my mom was in there with him and he said we got to get we got to get the hose out of the door they're probably going 90 almost 100 miles an hour and she said, I'll do it. So he's holding on 
to uh, this rack in the top of, of the ambulance. He grabbed my mom's waistband and she pries the door open, gets her foot and pulls the oxygen hose in. Oh oh. Okay. Oh. And, and then they get the oxygen going, but he goes, his heart stopped. So then I'm with these entities and then I'm getting this beautiful white light. And, and, and there was a message that came to me, which I'm not going to tell people because it's very important to, to the, to my book, the afterlife frequency. And then the next thing I knew there was this shock and they hit me with defibrillator paddles. And, 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 and I remember the paramedic screaming, we got a pulse. And I'm sitting there and, okay, I'm covered in rashes. I'm burning up in a fever. I've had a fireman beaten on my chest. I went into cardiopulmonary failure and, uh, and I've just been shocked. It's just been electrocuted back into physical life. And the Would thing. Would you say that was a bad day? It was a really rough day. And, and the thing, <laughs> you know, Scott, the thing, and it's really hard for me to say this, the thing that hurt me the most was seeing my mother crying. Oh, yeah. Because she thought I died. Because I did. <laughs> I did. And then, then um, they brought me back. And um, so, so that, that uh, was my, my NDE. And when people read the afterlife frequency, you'll find uh, why the message that I received from God is is so important, not just to that story, but to everything. To everything, um, the afterlife is real. You know, we've had fifty years of near death experience research that Dr. Raymond Moody started, and, and God bless him, he's still going at full speed. He's just incredible. And then IONS, the International Association for Near Death Studies. NDERF, the Near Death Experience Research Foundation, our sister organization, the um, Institute of Noetic Sciences, the Edgar Casey Association for Research and, uh, and Enlightenment. There's there's credible scientific organizations now studying this phenomenon. And as a psychic medium, I communicate with spirits pretty much on a daily basis, and I've conducted over fifteen thousand readings. And the things that come through. Um, there's no way I can make any of this up. So without a doubt, the afterlife exists and it is explainable, yes, through faith, but also it can be quantified and explained through quantum physics. Yep. So your near-death experience sounds a lot like what happens to some people in a shared death experience, like the one that I had. Yeah. Um, how does that, how do the two of them relate to each other as, as you've seen it? This gets back to my EMS theory. Yep. We have five different types of brain waves: gamma, beta, alpha, theta, delta. Gamma, that's when you're on uh, final jeopardy and your brain is just cranking, all right? That's when you're doing the calculus homework, all right? So gamma is ultra high uh, uh, functioning. Beta, is the state that we're in now. That's the awake activity of daily living uh, uh, frequency. And then when we start to relax and daydream and uh, go to sleep, that's alpha. And I always joke and call alpha the groovy baby state, you know, because alpha is really, you know, you start to relax. And then when you get to theta, theta is deep sleep, and that's where you dream. And then there's delta, very little brainwave activity. But delta is important because that's where you heal, that's where um, your immune system works. So that's real important. But is the alpha theta border, there is a range, um, I think it's between eight and 13 megahertz, which is, is a zone where psychic and mediumistic activity occur. Normally, it takes hours to get to this point in the sleep state, which is why so many people have um, visitations from loved ones in spirit because spirits can see that and they align their vibration with that alpha theta border. Now, so somebody is transitioning. Now I'm getting over to death, um, to, to uh, share death experiences. 
Shared death experiences and deathbed visions are very closely aligned because people who are in the transition, um, transitional state, somebody, let's say, who's terminally ill and they're passing, oftentimes, and it's, it's being reported much more now, I think it's been documented throughout history, but now um, p- there's less of a stigma reporting this where people prior to death start talking about spirits of loved ones coming to greet them. Now, so what's going on here? The person who is dying, their electromagnetic soul is in the process of transitioning. Spirits who are electromagnetic souls, they're coming in and their vibrational frequency is is beginning to touch the EMS of the person dying. But then people in close proximity, family members, dear friends, healthcare workers, hospice workers, even the ones uh, uh, who, who don't have mediumistic ability per se, their electromagnetic souls, brainwave frequencies start overlapping. So all of a sudden, you've got this huge frequency overlap. So in a shared death experience, you may pick up on the spirits coming to greet the person dying. You may get this floating sensation. You may feel like you're being lifted off your feet. You may hear beautiful music. And and I've seen this because I've been called to uh, the, the bedside of a number of people dying. At the point of death, you will actually see a surge of light come out of the person dying. And so the EMS theory, my EMS theory, explains shared death experiences on the basis of frequency overlap. Think of it like this. Let's say you're driving down the interstate and you're listening to um, your favorite FM radio station. And then you see along the side of the interstate, there's an AM radio station. And all of a sudden, you start getting the radio frequency interference, and you pick up for a few seconds or more of what's being broadcast on AM, even though you're listening to FM. Okay, it's the same principle. We may be, okay, here we are in our beta state, but we're in proximity to somebody who is in the transition um, to to, uh, the afterlife, and then our brainwave frequencies start overlapping with those of the transitioning person as well as people who are from the other side. So you've been bedside with people that have made their transition and have been part of this. Oh, yeah. Uh, Yes, on on a number of occasions. And what did you experience with with a shared death experience? well, you know, I don't want to give those away because uh, those are, are biggies in the book. Um, but um, what I have done... Let's give us a hint. Give us a hint. I was at the bedside of, of a woman um, who was probably about 90. And her adult children were there. And... One of them was real on board with what I do, and the other one's not so much. And I started saying, who's Dolly and who's Dottie? And they go, Aunt Dottie and Aunt Dolly? I go, one's a redhead and one's uh, blonde. And they're like, oh, my God. And And they started making a list, and I picked up on 27 people. They could identify 21 of them. The other six were farther back in time. And I remember saying, look, this is going to sound really crazy, but there's a spirit of a ginger, ginger colored tabby, an orange tabby, and I'm getting the name Harpo. And their jaws dropped. And they said, our mom had a cat, a, an orange tabby named Harpo like 40 years ago. I love it. And they're like, it's great. <laughs> And and what was really cool, though, Scott, is at first they were being resistant. And then when they started seeing this happening, then a couple of them said, Daddy, Daddy's here. And their father had passed like five years before. 
Mm-hmm. And so people that were very, very skeptical then felt the spiritual presence of their father who had passed. So that's a snippet of, of, of what of what I saw, but I'll, all right, I'll tell you a little bit more is at one point, I, this flash went off. Okay. And I was sitting in a chair near, near the woman who's passed. And all of a sudden I was in this room and the room was all white. And I saw this big, look like a threshold and the threshold appeared to be blue sky with some clouds going by. And the woman, her name was Marie, she was standing in the doorway, but she didn't look like a 90-year-old woman. She looked like an attractive, you know, 20-something with dark hair, and she was wearing this beautiful dress. And I walked up to her in this vision, and she said, Mark, I'm afraid I'm not ready yet. And I said, then don't go. And then I came out of it, and everyone was looking at me going, what just happened to you? And then... About, I think it was six or seven hours later, um, and we were all exhausted. And I was sitting there, and the flash happened again. And there was Marie looking in the same room on the threshold, very confident. She says, I'm ready now. And, and I knew I had to leave then and um, because the family needed to be with her. And if people want to find out what happened, they're going to have to read the afterlife frequency. <laughs> well, there is a teaser. So, well, it, it was it was it was very it was very intense, and and you know, being a medium, and people call me to the scene because I'm there to to assist. I'm not there to interfere. So have you been in a position where you're with the the person who's making their transition, but somebody else is also, like it's a a group event? I'm sorry, is what? Like a group event or, you know, two of you there at the threshold or more? Other people Um, in the room experiencing what you're experiencing? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's why um, this family started picking up on the presence of their father. So they went from being all skeptical to now they were beginning to detect um, spirits. See, with with spirit communication, uh, the problem most people have is they block it. Uh, their skepticism, negative emotions, uh, you know, people in a profound state of grief. That's why I always recommend if you want to uh, come to a medium, and make contact with a loved one in spirit, you should wait about four to six months after the death. A lot of people want the contact right away, but they're overwhelmed with grief and sadness and and they could be, you know, hysterical. And so they're not going to get anything out of the experience. Plus those emotions are, are blocking it. And four to six months later, you've come to a more stabilized emotional state, and then you're going to be more receptive. But there's a lot of people that come in and say, well, I don't believe this. Well, you know, they're all, I, you know, I, I say they, they just raise their deflector shields. You know, we got to lower those deflector shields. <laughs> and do some people have those, those shields up permanently? Because, you know, there are folks out there who say, well, I've, I've tried this. It's never made a connection, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they do. And I got a funny story um, along those lines. Um, I was doing a re- I was doing readings and um, it was is and this woman came to see me. She was very open to this and she brought a friend with her. And I guess the friend drove her and the friend was sitting there and goes, I don't believe in this. I don't believe in this. I said, you know, but she goes, but I want to watch. And she had this real negative attitude. And I said, all right, that's right. So I started doing the reading for a friend and, and uh, we're making good connections and then at the end of the reading, I said, okay, a father, a father is coming in. And I'm hearing Woody Woodpecker go, do, 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 And he said, guess who? And the client's like, that doesn't make any sense to me. The woman bottled up, tears are streaming out of her eyes. She goes, oh, my God. 
She said, when I was a little girl, my daddy would tuck me in and he'd close the bedroom door and then open it, stick his head in and go, guess who? Just like Woody Woodpecker. Let me tell you something. That woman has referred me more clients. <laughs> that completely turned her around. She said, my God, how could you know that? And I said, I don't. But your father came through and he gave you that message which was a very tender, tender memory that you shared with your dad. Yeah. So this work that you do, um, it's helpful for grief, PTSD, you know, other kinds of emotional situations we find ourselves in. Um, I believe that spirit communication is an extremely important therapeutic step in the journey through grief. It's not a, you know, it's not a Harry Potter magic wand that you wave and make somebody all better. I, I wish that it were. Um, I wish I could take the pain away from um, parents who've lost a child. I wish I could take the pain away from someone who's lost their spouse or, or you know, somebody very close. But with grief, grief is a lifetime journey. And there's nothing that we can do about the fact a loved one has died. But Scott, what we can do is change how we react to the death. And in, in my work as a medium and as an attorney, I, I've coined something I call grief, crime, grief. What I started seeing in the practice of law is a lot of people with addiction problems. Okay. And I discovered in their formative years, either as a child or young adult, there was a significant loss that wasn't addressed and wasn't dealt with. See, not all families will sit down and talk about, you know, grandma died or even a beloved pet, or what if um, a child lost a sibling or a parent I mean, some people come from families where, oh, don't think about it. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. You can't suppress it. You can't deny it. So what happens is by not dealing with grief, it will lead the person to impulsive behaviors, addictive behaviors, because addiction self-medicating pain most of the time. Um, impulsive behaviors could be acting out sexually or stealing things or, or rage, get into fights. So what happens is is the grief leads to behavior which results in criminal activity which inflicts grief upon someone else. Think of a drunk driver, mm -hmm. someone who's a chronic alcoholic. They never had um, resolution of their grief. When they got behind the wheel of that car after having 10 drinks, they didn't mean to kill somebody, but they do. So their unresolved grief led to crime which inflicts grief on other people. And I started seeing that in, in when I was practicing law and, and I would start picking up on, um, I've, I've got stories on, on that too, but I would pick up on the fact that there were loved ones around them. So I would try to get them in grief counseling in addition to the alcohol and drug counseling because the, uh, the alcohol and drug counseling is important, but that's the band-aid. We need to get to the source of what's causing that type of pain. And so the grief crime grief syndrome is, is a very, very terrible thing in our society. When it comes to children who are grieving, you can't just dismiss or ignore their feelings. Children are very perceptive, but they may not have or they do not have the skill set in how to deal with the grief. So that's what an adult's responsibility is. Get them the counseling, be supportive, let him or her cry. Uh, one of the things that, that I try to teach men, you know, Scott, we were raised, you don't cry. Okay. All right. We're playing football. We get tackled, break a collarbone. Don't cry. Okay. <laughs> meanwhile, a girl. I never had will, a problem with that. <laughs> yeah. Me meanwhile, a girl will have a, a zit pop up in the day of, of the prom and she's like crying and all her friends are working with her and all that. The thing is, um, and, and I'm just, you know, generalizing here, but, but men historically 
have been socialized not to express their feelings. And the only emotion socially acceptable to express in public has been anger. Wow, that's really helped human history, hasn't it? <laughs> All right. But the thing is, we have tear ducts, we have feelings, we have hearts for a reason. And for all the men that are listening, recent studies at USC and at an um, institute in Minnesota have found that tears of grief contain the neurotransmitters, in other words, the chemicals that cause depression. And so tears of grief are actually chemically different than reflex tears, which would be like, you know, sneezing from pollen or dust or something. And so it is actually psychologically, physically, and I believe spiritually healthy to cry. So when you are experiencing grief from the death of a loved one, you don't have to cry in front of people, but drive your car somewhere, park, or go to that that special place you have and just let it out. And you will feel afterwards relieved. Why? Because you actually got out of your body the chemicals that are contributing to the sadness. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's a spiritual lesson for all of us. Yeah, it's yeah, right next to anger there might be aggression in terms yeah. of what men are allowed to show. Well, it, it's true. And you know, uh, well, I was very close to my dad and he was a tough guy. I mean, he was an Navy SEAL. All right. And, and, and I learned pretty young in life, you know, you don't t- tease Navy SEALs. <laughs> um, but um, he told me never be, a, he goes, a real man is never afraid to cry for somebody he loves. And I was like, wow. And now, this is a story that that uh, it's not in any of my books, but I learned something very important. When I was a kid, if a fly got in the house, my dad would go berserk. He'd grab a fly swat and he'd go, like, I mean, like he'd like destroy the place trying to kill. And my brother, sister, and I, you know, we would like make jokes about it. And like, like for his birthday, we'd all buy him different color fly swatters and all this. And then, and, and, and then finally, um, one day I was a teenager and I said, dad, come on, what is the deal with the flies? And he opened up to me and he said, ever been on a battlefield where the bodies of your friends blown to bits are everywhere and they're covered in flies? Oh, my. Oh, my God. I never joked about that with him again. It never occurred to me. This was part of his post-traumatic stress from being in combat. It never occurred to me. You know, we see these movies and, you know, they have their war movies and everyone's laying there and, yes, they're dead and all that. But the reality is the battlefield's not like that. There's flies all over the body. There's birds. I mean, it, and, and the, the stench, the, the smell. And it gave me a tremendous amount of insight into my, my father. And, you know, um, people who put themselves in harm's way for our protection, um, military first responders, they're under stresses and pressures that we need to make an effort to, to if if we can't understand at least to respect and and um i remember i i told that story at a grief summit and there was a guy there that works at the military and when i said the fly he went like this because he immediately knew what i was going to say and he came up and he talked to me afterwards he said i'm glad you told that because a lot of people don't understand it until you know until they see it yeah so how does your work help with PTSD? That seems to be a maybe similar to grief, but but dug in a little differently. Well, post-traumatic stress disorder, in a way, Scott, we all suffer from it to varying degrees. Anyone that's had a loved one die, particularly if you're at the bedside of the loved one and you see someone you love take their last breath, that's something that sets in. That's a trauma. Um, 
Some people experience it with the death of a pet. It's very traumatic. Certainly military personnel. Uh, look at all the people that, that survived uh, something like 9-11. And so spirit communication can help when it it when the spirits that that died, obviously the spirits that died, when the people who died are they let them um, um and and the survivor, the survivor's guilt is a big part of PTSD. Why did I live when in, in why did I survive that car accident when my child died? And then the spirit of the child or who whoever the loved one is comes through and establishes contact, gives messages, and helps to relieve the guilt. It, 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 you know, once again, it's not a magic wand that immediately resolves everything, but it can start the road to healing. So spirit communication can do a lot for lessening the severity of the psychological trauma caused by, by death. We're at a spot for... Uh... It's kind of, we need to wrap this up. So do you have a, um, a spiritual message for the world? What is it? I do. Um, and I'll tell you a quick story how I got this message. It was about two weeks after my mother died. We were very close, like I mentioned. And I was, I was a senior partner of a law firm. I'm driving back from, from court, and one of those waves of grief hit me. So I figured, let me pull over, and I'm in the parking lot of a convenience store, and all of a sudden, flash goes off. You know, I, I get a lot of these flashes, these visions when spirits are around, and I turn and I saw for a second her silhouette, beautiful silver white silhouette in the passenger seat, and her voice filled my head. And she said, Mark, you have the gift of mediumship so that you would not be crushed by grief, but now you must help those who are suffering with theirs. All right, so Scott, I'm now breaking out into a major sweat, and then she gave me the most important message of my life. She said, Mark, it is your life's mission to help people understand that God exists, that the afterlife, heaven exists, that your souls are immortal living spirits, that humans can communicate with souls, and that all of you will be reunited with us when it is your time to leave the material world and come into the light that you call God. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Mark. What a wonderful time we've spent together. Thank you, Scott. It's, it's an honor. I appreciate, um, appreciate you having me on. And where can people find out more about you and where you're going and what you're doing. Uh, please visit my website, just like the, the name of my book. It's afterlifefrequency.com. And I invite everyone to sign up for my newsletter to keep you up to date. Um, I've got a, um, a lot of tour dates this year. I do a lot of events online every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. I co-host The Psychic in the Doc. My co-host, Dr. Pat Basili, is a world-renowned behavioral psychologist. We take calls from listeners. I do readings, and she helps people uh, gain insights and interpret the messages. Um, and I'm also an author and a featured writer for Best Holistic Life magazine. So you can get a free online subscription. That's a gift for everyone. Um, hey. best, yeah, bestholisticlife.com. Sign up for your, for your free subscription. It's great. Because there's always really positive, um, um, empowering, and uh, healing articles in Best Holistic Life. And you can find out about all of that at afterlifefrequency.com. Everybody, take a chance and, and go to that website, websites, plural. And Mark, thanks again. And the rest of you, stick around. We've got some insights that I think you'll find interesting. From the Afterlife Files, thank you, Mark. Really been a pleasure. Thank you. I told you, wasn't that fun to hear from a serious psychic explorer? There are a couple of points that could be expanded. 
Just to be clear, these are my viewpoints, but that's why you watch the Afterlife Files, to gain perspective by using more than one lens with which to view this rich information. Mark's advice to wait four to six months after a loved one has passed to try to connect through a medium is right on. In our NDE meditation work, we have found exactly the same thing. Too much grief, too much emotion, too many expectations. They all just get in the way. As Mark put it, <laughs> I love this, the deflector shields are up. Very Star Trekky. It takes some time for them actually to come down. So we're, so then we can actually uh, be open enough to establish this connection. Okay, so here's point number two. I appreciate his emphasis on how the brain just hosts the EMS and is not the source of consciousness. Not. For those of you who are interested in the scientific confirmation of this, please read Dr. Pim Van Lommel's breakthrough book, Consciousness Beyond Life. Lastly, the concept of the zone between the afterlife frequency and the material world is important. We've been able to determine that it's much easier for those in the non-physical to lower their frequency than for us in the physical to raise ours. All of us here in the physical, we often wind up asking, well, when do you do this? And how do you do that? And by how much? The folks on the non-physical side of the veil know all of these answers already. We need training here in the physical on how to do that. I hope that videos such as this can give you some insight on what near-death and shared death experiencers discover about the afterlife, the nature of consciousness, and how to live your life more fully. If you're watching on YouTube, Please like, subscribe, and comment. It's a like, it's free. So just go do it, will you please? Thank you. You can find the Afterlife Files on all podcast streaming apps. Apple, Google, Spotify, Audible, the lot. And please pay us a visit at neardeathmeditations.com. That's neardeathmeditations.com. Bye now. We'll see you next time. And thank you for joining us at the Afterlife Files.